Hey, you guys. What's up, my fellow CST people? How is everybody? I hope everyone is doing well. I hope y'all had a fabulous Christmas and an awesome new year. I didn't do anything <laughs> for neither holiday. Um, I was chilling. My son was gone to his bed, and I got a chance to do absolutely nothing. And if you have kids or responsibilities, you know how it is when you can just say, I am not doing anything and so that's what I did and I loved it so um now I'm back at it the, the year's begun and it's time to hit the ground running baby we're gonna go ahead and get started with this study session now for you guys that don't know me and you haven't seen the video if you haven't seen the video go over to YouTube um and check it out you could probably just google surgical tech on YouTube and I think it probably will come up and then uh, check it out is I guess is in detailed enough. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback on it. I think the video is really low quality because it's on my webcam. I hate recording on my webcam, you guys. And yet again, here I am. But this is where I'm at. I guess I need to buy like a better webcam because I never like the quality of my webcam videos. And so they hardly ever get posted. And then I did post that one and you guys actually liked it. And so here we are. I decide, I've decided that um, it's time for me to further my surgical tech career. If Okay, so I was a surgical tech in the Navy, and I decided that I was going to continue to do that when I got out. And so now, um, I got, um, it's been almost 10 years since I graduated, or actually it'll be 10 years in July, um, that, it, that it's been since I've been a surgical tech, and... I never had to take my certification like basically you can get a job as a surgical tech without having your certification once you get to my age or to the level of to the length of time that I've been doing it excuse me you realize that you can't get certain jobs because you don't have the certification and so now it's time to get the certification so last year I attempted to take it and I was unsuccessful I failed it. But it was totally my fault. Like, it was nobody else's fault because, really, I should have studied. Like, there was no reason for me not to study. I had all the material that I could have possibly needed. And I had this, you know, I know what I'm doing, attitude. And guess what? <laughs> Two points shot. And I was like, you idiot. I had already had this um, study guide printed, ready to go, like, there was really no excuse, and so $300 gone down the drain just because I'm an idiot. So I hope you're not an idiot like I am. Learn from my mistakes and crack open the book. And luckily, like, they, um, the the National Board of Surgical Tech and Surgical Assistance offer us a outline, the content outline. So let me make sure you guys can see this. So if you go to... There it is, national, so nbstsa.org. This is the website you need to come to. This will tell you if you're eligible, how to become eligible, what you're eligible, eligible for. Are you going to work with me? Okay. I don't know what my, I don't know what that is got going on right there. But anyway, so here you go, certified surgical set. And you guys can come to this page later on. I'm really not going to go through this because it's like, well, it's four different ways, I guess. I don't know. Most people go through surgical. Did I click surgical assist? Okay, so yeah, most people go through, like, go to school and then they have the option. Um, this is the one that I. This is how I am able to, um, be, you know, be a surgical tech because I was trained in the military. So that's the one that they have me under. And if there's anyone out there, I am gonna cover this. If there's anyone out there that is a military surgical tech. Please go ahead and get your exam now, and then you can also take the exam for Surgical First Assist, which will be my next adventure, hopefully. And so, they also have a military option for uh, the regular CSTs. You, um, what does it say here? I don't think, um, let's see, done within two years. I don't think there is no restrictions except for you have to do the extra 200 cases and take the test. I think it's the same, 
Or maybe you do have to go back to school. I don't, I don't think you do. I don't know. Application for this past, oh, okay, so, wow, so you got to the end of the year to get that one. And this one. Oh, wow. Look, you guys. Applications for this pathway will no longer be accepted after December 1st. So they're giving us a year to get this shit together. So I'm going to make sure I do this because, damn, I didn't know they had that. So, yeah, they, they just put this up here. That wasn't there to, um, for too long. But that's good to know. So one year to get my um, um AS or... What is, what is this? First assist. But anyways, I'm babbling. So let's go ahead. It's five minutes into this game. Let's do this. So anyways, come to this website. And the point of me bringing you here is because they offer outlines to their exams, which makes for a fantastic study guide or at least guideline. So you go here, you click on examinations like I did, and then you'll see the outline. And so here's the breakdown of the exam. Oh, yeah. Perioperative care is coming in at 105 questions. This is, a very, this is the largest section. So, I mean, if you need to study a section, this probably would be a good section. But, you know, at the same time, I feel like um, not intraoperative. That's coming in at 66. Is that right? Um, 29 is preoperative, 66 is intraoperative, and then post-op it would be 10. That's a total of 105. Additional duties is 20. 10 of them are administrative personnel. Questions, another 10 is equipment and sterilization, equipment sterilization and maintenance. That's the 20. And then this is the top, this is the subject that I would think would be the most um difficult and that's because it's i mean if you don't like science or not even like science i feel like you have an advantage in this area if you have experience in the medical field i mean you, yeah you're gonna have advantage if you have experience in any field if you're taking an exam for it but if you're fresh out of school and you're taking an exam i mean the chances that you pass them are okay i'm pretty sure but i feel like if you can relate, um, if you can find a way to relate or apply some of these things that you read into what you already know, it just makes it e that much easier to um, retain it and understand, you know, what it is you're reading. So, a and P, I I mean, y'all, yeah, that's a serious subject. To me, it is. I don't know how anybody else feels about a and P, but I feel like anatomy is just, you know, it's just so much to the human body that it's just one of those subjects that I feel like to go on and on and on. And so, yeah, but it, it's on, they're only asking you to know 30, you know, 30 things. And they even give you a breakdown of the categories that they're going to be, you know, discussing. So that makes it so much easier. And then the last one is microbiology. Yeah, that's probably a tough subject too, and definitely pharmacology, surgical pharmacology. Like, I feel like this is the hardest section, even though it's one of the small, like, it's it's a medium section. I guess it's the middle one, but I feel like this section will probably take more time to study than the perioperative care, patient care portion, this one. I feel like that'll be, you'll probably be able to kind of feel your way through that <laughs> based off of the um the questions and reading the questions i think you might be able to you still need some knowledge but you can probably learn know this because because of what you've learned in school versus knowing um the a and p and the um my dog is making a weird noise and microbiology and, and, and surgical pharmacology so anyways when y'all get a chance go to the website print it out then you'll know what you should be studying or what you might need to cover more or whatever and so there it is i am still really shocked that they're changing the ways that you can that's crazy so yeah it's crunch time anyway moving right along to the powerpoint that i so graciously put together here let's figure out how to work it. Yeah, there we go. And let's center this. 
that is annoying. There we go. All right, you guys. Here we go. So, oh, I guess if you, well, yeah. So, here we go. Hold on one second. I can't see what I want to do. Okay, you guys. Here we go. So, we're going to take the test to be a certified surgical tech. And here are my notes. And so, as you see, I have the more, what is it, more tricks? I don't know how to pronounce that, but there it is. I think it's mom tricks. I don't know. Anyways, their study guide. The link to the study guide below is below in the description. And yes, you guys, if you purchase it through the link, I will get a percentage of it or like a commission. It's a commission, but the link is through Amazon and, um, Basically, what they do is they, um, you download it, and then I went and I printed it out at um, Office Depot. It's like thirty something dollars, though. Like they can, they'll send you a copy for thirty something dollars. I think it's like thirty two or thirty three dollars, or you can download it for the same exact price. But I wanted mine like right then, and so I went ahead and downloaded, it, and then I sent it to um, Office Depot, and they printed it out for me and poked the holes in it so yeah anyways so um as a disclaimer i am not associated with the national board of surgical techs and surgical assistance i am not um and then i also put in there about the links in the in the description so yeah if, it, if it's a link to a product in the description bar you guys um is yeah, I get a commission, but the only thing I think that would be in this description bar would be the um link to this this um this study guide. But I also have two apps, and both of them I got from the AS or the National Board of Surgical Tech and Surgical Assistance website. So if you go to the Play Store, I don't know if it's on iTunes or. If you people with iPhones can get it, but if you have a tablet that doesn't require you to have um, Apple, you can download it from the um, what is on his face? Oh, um, you can you can download it from the Play Store and just you know use it on your tablet or on your desktop. But um, both apps I think were like thirty nine ninety nine or maybe they were fifty forty nine ninety nine. But yeah, they. They're pretty pricey. I did take some screenshots, so I do have a few quiz questions um, that we'll probably be going over. But it's a lot of questions, you guys, and so I'll do my best. I'm not going to cover everything in this first um, video. Like, there is no way that I would be able to do it, but I will try to be um, as consistent and as thorough with you guys as I can so I'll be posting it posting the next video um to this next Monday night at, at nine so instead of me doing the hangouts like I was gonna try to do I'm just gonna post it um on my YouTube channel because it was some weird stuff happening and then it didn't share my screen and it was just I, it was a mess so anyways here we go that's the exam. We've already went over this, you guys. And there's the outline below, or the link to the outline below. And I really, 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 really highly suggest you go get it. Like, when I was in the military, we had to take these exams, the advancement exams, and the advancement exams came with a bib. And that's basically what it was. They gave you an outline of what was going to be on the test. And so that's kind of how I took the approach to that um, outline. So anyway... The um that's the book. This is the book. Oh, this is what I was trying to say. So is Memotrix. Oh, I spelled it wrong on the other page. So yeah, Memotrix. Anyway, that's what it looks like. All right. So y'all already saw that the perioperative care portion of the exam is 105 questions. Let me make sure you can see that. 105. Oh, wow. Let's stretch this. Hold on, you guys. Oh, I can't do it right now. Maybe, wait. Okay, so I just had to pause it, but I got it in there. So, there you go. It's in the frame now. So, 105 questions. Um, The perioperative per portion, like I was saying, of the test covers 105 questions. And like I told you, that is a really big section. 
So, yeah. There's three parts to it. So, when you start, when you look at the study guide itself, let's go to the study guide. I'm going to come back to that. But when you look at the study guide itself, you will be able to see the outline. I'm going to show you how they break it down. The test, the, the test down, or the, the book, how they break the book down, excuse me, not how they break the test down. But see, they break it down in perioperative, and then preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. But when you start looking at the, the, um, the, the actual note, the study guide, you see that they come, they start at operating room cycle. So that's where we're at right now. So back to the PowerPoint. <clears throat> I can't see it. Oh, that's not it. Is that it? There it is. Okay. Oh, man. It took us all of that at the beginning. All right. I guess I want to do that again. So, anyway. Oh, I need to go back. Yes. Three phases. And then, so we're in the operating room cycle. I thought this dot, this little image was really cool. So, I plugged it in right there. And I only thought it was cool because this is. This is basically how it will look visually. So preoperative, pre meaning before, prior to, intro meaning during, and post meaning after. So operative, are, you know, that's what you're doing. It's, anyway, so y'all should know what operative is. Anyways, you put those words together and what you get is the first one, phase one. Preoperative. So, really, this is the beginning of the day. That's how I see it. The beginning of the day, the beginning of the case, the beginning of everything. <laughs> All right. So, when you come in in the OR, the first thing that you will do is you will do a wipe down. Like, you have to do a wipe down as part of your, um, like, that's just the rule. You come in, you do a wipe down. They normally have these, like, sandy wipes or some type of solution that you use to wipe down um, the stuff, the lights, the bed. We typically don't mop in the morning. But you do wipe everything else down. The back table, the mail stands, you know, everything, basically, that's in the OI. After that, um, you do your case card check. At least that's what I would do. I would go make sure that well, first you need to know, okay, this part isn't on in their study guide. But first, the first thing you need to know is what you're doing that day. So you would go and ask or figure out what your assignment is and go ahead and go to your room. Once you find out whose room you're in, you would grab your case card and then go to the room, get the room ready, and then bring your case. Once the room is, once you've done your initial cleaning, then you can bring your case card in the room and anything else that you're going to need for that case. So if it's laparoscopic, you know you're going to need a tower and a monitor. You need to make sure you got your, your cameras, your light cords, you know, everything that you need, troll cards, everything that you're going to need. Make sure you got enough um, gas. Make sure that the towers are working. <laughs> that check equipment, that's real, especially when you're dealing with digital or technology anyways. That stuff always it just messes up. And so, because you're the surgical tech, you're going to be expected to know how to fix it or at least how to run the check to make sure it's working properly. Um, once you've gotten everything situated, you already know, um, you know, you got all your your case card is checked. I would go ahead and check all my cases if you could. At least the first two or three, like the first two definitely. If you could get that third one in there, go ahead and go for it. But definitely get um, as many as you can checked out. Um, and so once all of that is done and the case is, the um, case card has been checked and you put all your specialty equipment and everything that you want to have opened, you put it, you know, you put it where they can see to open it. Then you create this sterile field or a sterile environment. What happens is typically you're going to open up your stuff on your back table and while you're opening up either well not open it it should already be open by this point but the patient is coming in the room and so either your field basically you should have already set up your back table like 
the patient is coming to a room that's already sterile. Like, but I feel like by the time the patient come in there, I should have already been counting and ready to like. Sometimes I get done and I'm able to break and help position the patient. Um, and so that's so basically that's where we're at right now. You, you create your sterile field. You position the patient. Um, you also make sure that the patient is prepped. So either the nurse is gonna prep the patient. Or you're gonna prep the patient. The doc might prep the patient. Um, also, when you're positioning, you need to make sure that you have whatever you need to make sure that that person isn't harmed during that procedure. So if they're laying um, on their side, you know, in a lateral position, and you need to make sure you have enough air crate or padding, whatever your place has, you need to make sure you have enough of that. Um, you might need an armrest on board and stuff like that so just make sure you have all that stuff ready um but you'll know in, in the beginning i guess when you find out what case you're doing what what you'll need but yeah so once you get the patient positioned and then um they're put to sleep then everybody that needs to scrub in scrubs in that's basically what happens everybody gets the patient position everybody you know, is doing their thing, but once the patient is asleep and, you know, it's time to make sure that whoever needs to be scrubbed in is scrubbed in and, you know, you go from there. So this is what the book has to say about it. I'll give you guys a few seconds to look at it. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm sorry. I just don't believe in reading PowerPoints. All right, so if you need to, if you need some more time, just come back to it. It's here for you. All right, so phase two and phase three. Um, intraoperative phase is basically when you're doing the actual surgical procedure. And phase three is the postoperative phase. And that's when the patient, the case is over and the patient is being transported or transferred to the PACU or already in PACU. But to go into detail, there's some more <laughs> there's some more notes for you. And you um I did highlight a lot of the stuff. The stuff that I highlighted, um, that's what I felt was important. It's up for down here. But I didn't do this one because you'll see in a second. Alright, you guys, I'm moving on to the next one. And here is where really the case is over. If you go to the I'm gonna back up. If in the intraoperative phase the biggest thing that you need to know is, oh, you know what? I meant to mention this on the uh, on the post on the pre-op, but I guess this is the per appropriate place because this is where they put it at. But you need to make sure you count and do a timeout before the case is started. You can't do anything until you know how many instruments you have and what you have. Like you can't. You can't start surgery on somebody and you don't know that you have six Kellys because if you end up at the end of the case with only four, y'all got to figure out where the other two are and somebody's either going dumpster diving, we're calling x-ray, just make sure that you um, do the count first and I would, like, I personally would try to count before the patient come in the room but sometimes you don't have that luxury so you count as fast as you can. Hopefully you're familiar with your set so you already know what's in it and what should be in it. And so you count. Once you're done counting the um and, and the patient is asleep and everybody's scrubbed in and right before the doc gets ready to cut, right before that initial cut, y'all need to have a timeout. Or not right before, but it needs to be before he cuts that patient or in the process of it's a little gray area right there but you're supposed to do your time out and your count before and yes it's just as much the surgical tech's responsibility to say we need to do a time out as it is anybody else in that room and sometimes it is the surgical tech that is saying can we do a time out we don't like who is like and not to say you gotta be a smart ass because i am but i'm like you know, are we going to count or are we going to, are we going to figure out who this person is? What are we doing? You know, like, and, and you don't have to be a smart ass with everybody, but sometimes you do, especially if it's somebody not paying attention to what's going on. So anyway, back to the notes. Also the note, the, um, it's, uh oh, sorry, you guys. My text messages. So anyways, also the doors, 
and the, the door should be closed at all times when a case is going on. You do not, the door should never be open for one. I feel like the door should always be closed to the OR. I feel like that. But it should always definitely be closed when the case is going on. The door should not be open. It is people walking back and forth throughout the hallways, kicking up dust and everything. Keep the doors closed. Like, like for real, just keep the doors closed. Don't be running in and out of the OR. Don't be doing it like just don't keep the doors open. I do not like that. Especially if it's a laparoscopic case. Like, that just messes up the people who are, who've been in the room eyes because typically it's a dark room. And so then you got this person that just busts in and now it's all bright. And you're like, dang, now my eyes got to readjust. So anyway, moving along. What else is this important in this part? I think I got it all for you. If you didn't get this one in, you can bring it, you know, record or re replay this video at any time. I'm getting tongue tied. So post op is definitely the case is over. The patient is in the PACU or en route to the PACU. The first thing that you need to know is you do not break down your sterile field until the patient is extubated on the gurney and walk like being rolled out the door. Or you can ask anesthesia if it's okay. Like, that's an option. That's how I was trained. I was trained that you always ask anesthesia if you can break. And if you want to know why you ask anesthesia, because they are the ones that are monitoring this patient. They are in control of the head of the patient. If y'all don't know what the head of the patient contains, that is your airway. <laughs> they also monitor your heart. You know, that they, con they pretty much make sure your ass don't die. Or, you know, basically. And so... That's who you need to ask if you can break. You don't need to ask the doctor. You do need to ask the doctor some things, but if you want to break, you know, or if you aren't sure if you can break, just ask them. And some of them might look at you crazy, but then other people won't. They'll understand, like, why you ask them. But just kind of when you go to your first place, you know, if you haven't been somewhere, then you can kind of get a feel for what everybody's doing. But for test purposes, for the testing purposes, it says that you are not supposed to break your sterile until the patient is safely transferred to a post-operative gurney or a bed and taken to the PACU. So, that's what you go with. And the first thing, when you're looking at what you're breaking down, the first thing that I break down on my back table is my sharps. And um, I do that because typically, and you can see that here, that there, typically... Um, it's somebody in the room with you, like, um, that's going to help you break down. And so I try to make sure I have all my sharps in the sharps container or in the, in my, um, needle book so I can put it in the sharps container because I don't want one of my coworkers coming to try to help me and they end up getting stuck or I end up getting stuck. So that's the first thing that I dispose of. Um, the next thing is the specimens, as you can see here, you need to make sure that when you retrieving a specimen from the doctor, when the doctor is handing you the specimen, you ask him what it is. What is this? So you can know what to relay. And if you don't know how to spell it, get your skin marker and write it down. Ask him to tell you how to spell it and write it down. And if he doesn't know how to spell it, then whatever, but... Just ask him how to spell it or her, how to spell whatever it is. And if it's on the side, like if it's a breast, you need to know if it's right or left. Like you always need to know where it comes from and, you know, you need to know what it is. And so they, they're going to tell you and then you're going to tell the nurse if she hasn't heard. But typically you're going to relay that message and you want to make sure that you got that specimen off your back table before you break it down. You can get rid of them sharps if you want to, but you need to make sure that that specimen, I typically, even though it's in this section, I typically pass off my specimen before um, the case is over because I don't want to be the one to throw it in the trash. I typically just go ahead and tell the nurse, you know, if she's ready, if they're ready, then I'm going to pass it off. If they're not ready, then I can't pass it off because they're not ready yet. And so in that case, then you need to have it labeled and put in a certain location so you'll know where it's at every time like you don't need to if you know you put your specimens in the top left hand corner of your back table every time then you don't need to worry about where your specimen is because you already know you put it in the same place every time so that's that's the thing with the specimens the trash take the trash out 
make sure um you do it according to your facility policies because some people they have different rules and different ways so i'm not gonna even get into that i've i've had a label i've done all these and so and at the end of the case after everything is taken out of the room um all the supplies are put back that you haven't used then you need to clean or well, I guess you could do this simultaneously, but you need to clean the room. It's got to be re-cleaned. They're going to turn over the room. So if you got a team that turns over the room, that's that's pretty cool. But most techs and most hospitals will be turning the rooms over themselves. And so you need to do, know how to do that efficiently. And then also, um, at the end of all that, you basically just set up the next case. So... All right, you guys, that was the operating room cycle. So now we are moving into, we're moving into the instrument cycle. And the instrument cycle is the same as that three phases. So this should be fairly simple for you guys to, you know, retain because it's, it also is break, broken down into three areas. And here you go. Um, like I, you guys, you can come back and, and make your own notes of these notes, but these are directly from the book. And so I highlighted, um, make sure you have knowledge of, of the procedure. And you guys, honestly, that's just going to make the case go by that much smoother, honestly. If you know, you know the anatomy. And if you know what you're doing, if you know the procedure, then you'll know if you need any type of specialty equipment. And you also need to make sure you have the surgeon's preference card and you need that because it's going to help you, you know, it's going to outline what he needs and what he wants and you need to know that. So yeah, just giving you guys a moment to read over this. I want you to read all of it so you'll, you'll get a better understanding, not just of what I'm saying, but you can actually read what's in the book. All right, here we go. Moving on. <clears throat> so as you can see, the intraoperative phase was a little bit longer, or at least the paragraph was a little bit longer, which makes sense because it is the actual part where you will be doing the procedure as it, it is in the operating room cycle. The difference is in this part for the instrument cycle, this is where you will actually be handling the instruments, passing the instruments. And the thing about passing instruments, you guys, is you really need to know how to pass the instruments effectively efficiently whichever word applies to that, to that you need to know how to pass the instruments because if you go to pass the instruments to the doc and he's fumbling he's going to get frustrated because he's expecting it to be in his hand like in one swift motion he just wants it or she i'm sorry i say he you guys but i work with a lot of male doctors so Anyway, they're going to want a really smooth transition, not all the fumbly and twisting um, instruments around. Like, they want to grab the instrument and be able to use it in one motion. And basically, your job, which this is underestimated, because this is, I think, the only place they put this, but your job is to anticipate the surgeon's need. And the only way you can do that is by knowing the case. And the only way you're going to know the case is by being in the OR as much as possible. <laughs> So definitely scrub, 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 scrub. All right. Definitely back to the, the anatomy, you guys. You got to know what normal is so you can know what abnormal is. Mm, the instrument list, the count sheet. So when I was speaking of the count in the operated, the operation, or ugh, tongue tied. As I was speaking of the count sheet in the operating room cycle, the um this portion actually goes into detail about the count sheet. The count sheet is going to give you a list of the, the instruments that's in the set. And the instruments that's in this, they're going to have the instruments, the names of the instruments that's in the set and how many of that instrument is in the set. And you need to know that because, like I said, you need to know when you're counting what you started with so at the end you'll know what you should have yeah it's just a, yeah like it says the itemized list that's all it is of the instruments and then oh when you're counting you it's always the surgical tech and the circulator they don't cover that in here i don't think if they do i might have overread it or overlooked it but it's 
is normally at most places it's got to be the circulator oh excuse me you guys and it's got to be the nurse so or the nurse and the surgical tech excuse me that's the, the nurse that's circulating and the surgical tech that's who does the count the person that initials it is the person that assembled it so this isn't the same person it could be the same person but we are gonna say this is is two different people because SPD is the one that's processing it so if something's wrong with the set they're gonna go back to the person that initiated it and then figure out what happened but the count itself is done by a the circulator and the surgical tech definitely and if you're being when you do I don't even think they cover when you do it they might not even care but you need to do the count you know before you do the case but you also have to make sure that um where is it I don't think they have it in here okay so yeah I'm really surprised but yeah the circulator the circulator and the nurse does the count and on the list I'm just surprised I had to reread that you guys I was just surprised that I didn't um notice that before but anyway once you get your um your count done hang on one second all right, you guys, I'm back. So I had to go look through some notes to just make sure I wasn't overlooking anything, and I'm not. So they don't cover um, in this actual study guide. It doesn't cover um, who goes first, but you, or who, not who goes first, but it doesn't cover if you need to, if you need to have the circulator and the surgical tech. That's what I was trying to figure out. Like, is that the rule? But it might not be. I think that's just something that I learned over the years. But anyway, um, when you leave the room, like if you're going to be relieved to go to lunch, the person that's relieving you has to do the count. Um, and then when you are like, yeah, any type of relieving. So if you leave and somebody come over, comes over and takes over your back table and your mail, that's when that person does the count. So if you're relieving somebody, then you need to count. And the basic concept behind that is that person already knows where everything is. You need to be able to lay your eyes on, you know, all the stuff that you use or that is being used. And um, this is true, though. If anything happens or if the count is off or anything, you need to let the doc know. You also need to let the doc know that the count is correct. But um, if it's not correct, you know, you need to let him know because they have to order x-rays for that. And the post-operative phase is the last phase. And this is when you get in all your instruments back. The surgery is over. Hopefully it was successful. And when you get your instruments back, you need to make sure that um, you put everything in its proper place. Like sometimes you'll have instruments that's dirty. And not so much dirty because of the, the procedure, but dirty because of the area of the procedure so if you're doing like anything with bowels and vaginas and um rectum then that's a dirty those are dirty instruments and so you have to have like a separate basin for those or something if you're going to be working with those type of instruments because you can't mix dirty instruments with the other ones so in this in this case i'm, I'm sure they're meaning dirty as in the ones you use but i did want to elaborate on that like depending on like i said if you're doing a bowel obstruction some of the things that you use to occlude the obstruction once the obstruction has been occluded then you can't use those tool those instruments anymore because they have bowel on it and bowel is dirty and the same thing is the vagina like the vagina is dirty and so is the butt and the penis the inside well the urethra but no not even really the urethra is not dirty it's sterile so excuse me i'm going to take that back not the penis but the vagina is definitely dirty so now on so many levels so anyways the um once you get all your instruments and you've done your count and you have everything accounted for 
then um, you break it down. The case is over. The patient's gone. It's okay for you to tear down your um, sterile field. You go and you put the instruments that you use into, we're going to say the proper, as it says, being or area because each facility have their own like way of doing things. And then either SPD is going to come get it or you're going to take it to SPD, however they do it. And then once it gets to SPD, that it is again clean and decontaminated it is expected i used to work in spd too guys this is like one of the this is a laid back type job spd is but i like scrubbing so anyways um they're gonna expect it and make uh make sure it doesn't need any maintenance if it does they're gonna take it out and then they'll replace it with one that does work and then they reassemble the kit they sterilize it and then they um, send it back to its proper. Oh, you got to wrap it if it needs wrapping. Some sets don't need wrapping. They put them in their caskets. But once it's sterilized, it goes back to their um, depart to the department or wherever it needs to go with, and then it's just there until it's time to use it again. And that is it. That is it. Oh, I wrote it correct on here. That's it for this one, you guys. So what I'm gonna do is since we have a little bit of time. Ooh, what did I do? I am going to, where are you? Where are you? Oh, I closed it. Okay. So let me um, go through this, these little questions with you guys. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Where is it? Where did I put it? I think I put it on my desktop. There it is. All right. We're not going to go over the, all of, go over all of these. I am so tongue tied. There we go. All right, you guys. So I'm not going to read them to you, but I'm going to give you a few seconds. I'm only going to 15. So, yeah. I'll read it um, and then I'll elaborate, but I'm not going to read the question to you. Okay, I have nothing to say about that one. <laughs> Next one. Uh oh, did it go? Oh. Just try this. Yeah. Oh, a C and D, a D and C. So, I with lithotomy, I kind of remember legs up lithotomy. I don't know. That's kind of how I remember that. But you know, for D and C, that's G Y N. So typically, we're on our back and some stirrups, typically. Oh, yeah, you definitely want to always make sure you use irrigation on bone. The bone gets hot. It'll split. It's just not a cool. That's not good. Purple file. Yeah, it goes in your veins. That's the famous. I think Michael Jackson made this drug even more famous than what it was already low-key. Hey, which of the Oh, with your positions, I would definitely like Google positions and figure out a way to remember them. Like, you're going to have to come up with a way to remember them. Or you could just, I mean, if you don't need a way, I did. I had to sit there and look at them several times. But this is one of the ones that I kind of automatically, I read them. To block the nerves so they can't feel it the nerve receptors I should say we just talked about specimens so it's appropriate to wrap yes especially in GYN um, cases you will do this in any case really because I've done it when I've collected biopsies that's probably the best way to do it because it's all on the TOFA and the TOFA is non-stick so they can put the TOFA inside the formula and then transport it to um, pathology. And yes, this is, this is correct, um, obviously because you need a stale barrier between 
the unsterile object in the patient. Definitely want to put that um, uh, uh, biological in a difficult place because what you want to make sure is that it is completely um, able to, the sterilant is able to sterilize the items that you're trying to sterilize. So if you put it in the hardest place and it doesn't turn the appropriate color, then you know that that load is not good and you need to figure some other things out. I always put it, the grounding pad on the outside of the thigh. The biggest part of the body basically is what you want to use. Uh oh. Yeah. And what they did was they was trying to, it seems like they're trying to confuse you because it's like, it doesn't matter what position they're in because that's still going to be the biggest part of their body. Or the most fleshiest part, I should say. Yeah, the fascia, 2-0. Boom, like a vice room. Oh, I don't know why I keep wanting to click next. <laughs> Did y'all see it? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's funny. Oh, man. So, this is a Flotron. This um, device, I'll show you guys what the Flotron is real quick here. And it basically helps, um, like I said, prevents with um, blood clots. If you've had a baby before, then I'm pretty sure you know what these is. If you've had surgery before or been in surgery before, then you know what these is. If you have not, then let's show you here a Flotron. These are Flotrons. This is the one that I normally see. Oh, I thought it was going to make it bigger. Man, it's $2,000 almost. So yeah, or this one. This is the same one. And then these little, those little things on his on the legs these little things right here this is the one that goes all the way up to the thigh this one stops at um below the knee i don't know what this one goes but they um it's air that's pumped through there and it just like massages but it feels really good yeah that's it oh this is the one that's what i was trying to show you this is the one i don't miss me and so what happens is if this one of them get kinked there's a little person, I don't know where the little person is, but it's a person, and it'll um, be flashing, and that's when you know that it's a kink in it. Yeah, that's a, that might be an older one. It was kind of old, but anyways, so yeah, that's that. Go back. That's a Flotron, that's a DVT machine. Oh man, I should have stayed over there. So, this is at the base of the, um, well, I guess at the beginning. I don't know how you would say it. Of the appendix. Or the, listen to me, of the appendix, of the cecum. Let's show you. <laughs> that was funny. I'm a little delusional right now, you guys. I need to go to sleep. Oh, why did I even. So that's it down there. Oh, good. Okay. So that's it. So, yeah. 
and then in reference to that the sea cone that's it down there. And so let's see what else. Ew, what's that? Oh. So yeah. And that's the bottom part of it. So your appendix, if you look at this stuff, if you pay attention when you're looking at it, now you can see, you know, where the appendix is located in relation to the um, intestines and, you know, everything else. So you guys, when you like studying and you're not sure, just get some um, Googling on your appendix, your cecum. That's it right there. See if they'll show us one that's lame. Ew. That's yuckiness. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> that's enough of that. And then how many more do we have? I was gonna stop at fifteen. Okay. Which of the following is classified as a clean contaminated? So the genitary, the genitary urinary tract is definitely, anytime genital or that, this is genital and urinary is definitely in that same um, genital, I should say, and urinary. But genital, I, I'm under the, it's, you can't, it's just dirtiness. But that's not what this is. I'm not sure. I'm confused, but anyway, I'm gonna have to go back and read this one. So, not not so much on the question, not so much on the um, question, but just the answer, I guess. So, anyways, you do need to know your your wound classes. That's what this is basically saying. But I was just trying to figure out what this was. But anyway. Yeah, we talked about this. Don't throw it away. I said you do. And that is an instrument that looks like But anyways, that's what it looked like. I was trying to show y'all a better picture of the the mouth part of it, but so when you would hand this to a dog, you would hand you would be holding it in this area. You really yeah, like in this area. And then when you put it in their hand they can just use it. So anyway, that's a carrot and rajour. I think it did say it was backbiting, did it say yeah, or bone biting. Hmm. Alright you guys, so I think we might be all done. That was pretty cool, huh? I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm pretty sure. How long is this? This is probably way longer than what it needed to be. Oh, no. I, I knew it was going to be an hour. So, I'm at the hour mark. I can't see down here. Mm -mm. Let's move this up so I can see. Yep. All right. So, let's see here. Oh, my body. My body. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> Looking a hot mess. 
But anyway, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll continue to go through the book and I'll continue to post them um, on, on Mondays at 9 o'clock until I'm through with the book. My goal is to take the test around February 15th. Um, yeah, 2016. And then, excuse me, immediately or while while I'm um, working on my CST or my, my ooh, I can't even speak. While I'm working on my CSA, I'll get my CST. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. And um, I'll still be scrubbing. So I don't have to, luckily, they don't require us, at least for another year or until December, they don't require us to um, be off the clock to get these 200 hours. So I'm really excited about that. I'm pretty sure I'll bust 200 hours wide open. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. Yeah, so at least I know 75 of them would be probably GYN cases. Oh, I didn't show you guys that that it makes you do like a case card. Um, I didn't mean to do that, but let's, let's see. Is it going to let me do it? Maybe not. All right, whatever. So, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and, um, I'm going to do my, I'm going to get my CST next month. And I'm pretty sure I passed it. And I'm pretty sure you will too, because we're not going to be bullshitting around this time and not studying because that's what idiots do. And they waste $300, really six, because now I have to spend another three. But anyway, we're not going to, you know, beat ourselves up about it or anything. <laughs> so anyways, you guys, you know, Tell me what you think. I know you guys are going to give me feedback. Make sure you're following me. I'm going to start, um, if you're not following me on YouTube and, and you were, I'm going to start separating my cosmetology stuff because I'm a hairstylist and I have my own little hair studio and that my hair stuff floods my YouTube channel. So I'm going to make another channel for that. But you can keep following me on the one that you're on if you want more surgical tech stuff. Oh, and I'm working in labor and delivery uh, right now at a new hospital. I'm going to try to see if they'll let me pick up some PRN um, hours in their main arrival. I'm pretty sure they will. And if that's the case, oh, my God, I'm 200 hours. It's going to be so easy to get. So, yeah, I'll be taking, like, somebody calls, some crap. I don't know. Anyways, you guys, see you later. <laughs>